On this episode of True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination, we will be continuing the story from our last episode entitled The Bitch of Bienville. When we left off, Louise Pete had just been convicted of the murder of Jacob Denton, and now she was on her way to prison. Would she learn the lessons of punishment and incarceration, or would she continue with her evil ways if and when she were ever released? Even after Louise began serving her sentence in November of 1921, she made another accusation as to the theory of the case concerning Denton's murder. She claimed that Denton actually died in a card game in South Carolina. Again, the California Supreme Court denied her request for rehearing based upon this new recent accusation. On December 3, 1921, in a desperate attempt to obtain a new trial, Attorneys for Luis moved before the United States District Court in California. The petition for a writ of habeas corpus alleged that Luis Pete was deprived of her constitutional rights when one of the 12 jurors was discharged by reason of illness and a 13th or alternate juror accepted without impaneling a new jury, beginning the trial over again or permitting her to exercise the full number of preemptory challenges. For the better part of a month, Luis's attorneys continued every legal maneuver to have their client released from California Institution of Women at Tehachapi. In mid-December 1921, Luis acted in desperation and contended that two men and a woman actually killed Jacob Denton. Again, Luis's story changed substantially to disavow her conviction. Luis stated that she and a woman companion accompanied by two men, met with Denton while the woman stayed in another room. A gunshot rang out, and when the two women entered the room, Denton sat in an armchair, dead, while one of the men held a pistol in his hand. The man holding the weapon instructed Luis and her female companion to leave, and he and the other unidentified man would take Denton to the hospital. The day after the shooting, Luis stated that one of the men involved with Denton's shooting explained to her that Denton was in a hospital, not seriously injured, and she left for Denver under this impression. Earlier the following year, on January 7, 1922, Judge M.T. Dewing denied Luis's appeal to overturn her conviction. Undeterred with this decision, Luis's attorney again petitioned the court for a rehearing to perhaps get a new trial. Instead of the public defenders, somehow, Luis afforded two top-notch criminal jurists, D.P. Chapin and L.R. Taylor, to petition the court for another trial. Again, this petition failed. Another petition for an appeal also failed in February of 1922. Subsequently, every motion filed on Luis's behalf failed miserably, and every variation of the truth Luis exclaimed proved falser than her claims before. Finally, in April 1922, Louise admitted the falsities of her stories without admitting that she murdered Jacob Denton. In November of 1922, Richard Pete, Louise's estranged husband, finally acquired a divorce from his wife. After supporting her from the time of her arrest until the expiration of her appeals, it became readily apparent that he did not believe her either. Louise Pete settled into Tehachapi Prison in the hopes her stay there would be relatively pleasant. One of the most heartrending blows delivered to Luis while in Tehachapi occurred during an interpenitentiary beauty contest held on June 4, 1923. Fellow female inmate Clara Tiger Woman Phillips, who hammered her husband's mistress to death, displaced Lofty Louise P. of Denver, Colorado as the prettiest woman in San Quentin. This rivalry rekindled at least twice a year, and in November 1923, Phillips and Luis again faced each other, along with 51 other contestants, for the title of the most beautiful woman in Tehachapi. Again, Luis lost out to the newcomer. Luis Pete, now a convicted murderer, attempted several times to remain relevant to society. 
It seemed that every time she exerted her constitutional rights, got into altercations with another inmate, or competed in prison beauty competitions, her every word found themselves in newspapers the next day. It also seemed that when she believed her name would disappear from the headlines, her relevancy turned its head once more. One of the more famous murders in Hollywood history occurred at approximately the same time as authorities discovered Jacob Denton's body in his basement. Louise stated in July of 1923 that Denton was murdered by the same people that murdered famed movie director William Desmond Taylor almost a year before she made the claim. With nothing to substantiate her claims and still proclaiming her innocence, Louise became the subject of a clemency campaign. In addition, Louise's estranged daughter from her marriage to Robert P. disappeared and Louise applied for a parole because she stated only she could find her daughter. The new district attorney for Los Angeles County, Burren Fitz, stated that he would oppose vigorously any attempt to commute Mrs. Louise's sentence. The California Pardon Board not only rejected Louise's request for parole in 1928, but also in 1931, 1933, and 1936. Louise sat and watched as other inmates walked free while she waited for her chance to leave Tehachapi. In 1938, Louise applied for parole once again. The following year, after careful consideration of her application, the California Parole Board granted her a hearing. At her parole hearing, reporter Caroline Walker, who covered the trial impartially in its entirety, stood before the parole board and proclaimed, the woman is too dangerous to be set loose on society again. She's managed to exist all her life by stealing, lying, by violence. Mark my words, if you turn her loose, it's going to be tragic for someone. One of the parole board members stated in response to Walker, that's the trouble with your newspaper people. You just can't believe prison can reform a person. The California Parole Board finally granted Louise her release, effective April 10th, 1939. On the following morning, April 11th, at the point of her release, Louise had served 19 years for Denton's brutal and nefarious murder. One would think that after fighting for years to prove one's innocence and steadfastly declaring that she did not murder the old millionaire, that Louise finally thought to exhibit the behaviors that would keep her out of prison. But once more, the worst demons of her nature dictated a different destiny and proved Walker's words prophetic. Upon leaving California Institution of Women in Tehachapi Prison in Tehachapi, California, in the spring of 1939, Louise Pete changed her name to Anna Lee. Louise disappeared from the headlines and worked as a housekeeper and reported regularly to her parole officer, Emily Latham. Latham got very ill and Louise moved into her small apartment to take care of her. Within a few months, Latham died of natural causes. Before leaving Latham's apartment to seek lodging somewhere else, she took a 32 caliber pistol from the dead woman's belongings, a pistol that once belonged to Mrs. Latham's deceased husband. With nowhere to go and steadily running out of money, one of Louise's old friends, Mrs. Margaret Logan, stepped forward and offered employment taking care of her invalid husband, Arthur Logan, 75 years old. The Logans lived in Pacific Palisades, California, and seeing that perhaps this may continue Louise's good behavior, the board approved of the move and Louise performed the duties of a practical nurse for her new sponsor. Margaret Logan firmly believed in Louise's innocence since the first trial in 1921. Mrs. Logan held no suspicions that Louise would revert back to her old ways, until one fateful day in the fall of 1944. Louise strongly suggested that Mrs. Logan should consider committing her husband to a mental institution. Louise managed to get the papers filed to do so without Mrs. Logan's knowledge in late 1943, but the judge refused to sign the papers ordering Arthur Logan's commitment. In lieu of placing Arthur Logan in a mental institution, the judge ordered that Arthur Logan be placed into a general hospital for in-depth observation. At Thanksgiving of 1943, Mrs. Logan, feeling guilty about leaving her husband in a hospital over a holiday, went to the hospital and retrieved her husband. Once the new year arrived, Mrs. Logan quit her factory job to stay home and take care of her husband full-time in 1944. During this time, Louise stated to Mrs. Logan that she had been waiting for the disposition of an estate due to her since the death of her ex-husband, Richard Pete. On the promise of this massive settlement, Margaret Logan invested heavily in property that, certainly at Louise's urging, hoped to sell the property at a profit. 
Soon, because she never discovered the disposition of the estate right away, coerced Mrs. Logan to pay for her to travel to Denver and investigate why the settlement was not forthcoming. Upon her return, Louise stated that she had no news about the estate. A few days after returning from Denver, Louise met a bank teller named Lee Borden Judson. Prior to becoming a bank teller, Judson worked as a newspaper reporter and advertising executive. Described as slightly older than his middle-aged paramour, Judson had graying hair and gold-rimmed glasses that made him appear like an elderly bookworm. After meeting Louise, Judson experienced her persuasive charm and physical promise of Louise at close range. He found her quite desirable. Judson and Louise became lovers, but due to the conditions of her parole, the affair had to be kept secret, even from Mrs. Logan. The matronly sponsor allowed Judson to move into her house as Louise's friend. With Louise, Judson, Mrs. Logan, and her husband cohabitating within the same residence, Arthur Logan's condition worsened. On March 19, 1944, Mrs. Logan placed her husband in a private facility more trained to handle his invalidity. Once Arthur Logan became a patient at the facility, he became unruly and noisy on occasions. Although Arthur Logan appeared to calm down, the facility never documented any instances where he became violent. With her real estate business stagnant and other people in the house, Mrs. Logan chose to institutionalize her husband so she can go back to work at an airplane factory. On May 2nd, 1944, Louise and Judson secretly married, a direct violation of her parole conditions, and moved out of the Logan household into a local hotel. Subsequent to Arthur Logan's commitment, Judson moving into the Logan residence and Mrs. Logan returning to work, Louise approached Mrs. Logan to finance her estate through a $50,000 real estate purchase that she planned to hold in joint tenancy. Louise failed to get the escrow deposit, but then Mrs. Logan pledged her savings to purchase the property. On May 19, 1944, Louise forged a check under Mrs. Logan's signature for $200 and deposited it into a checking account that she held with Judson. The bank teller immediately recognized the forgery and notified Mrs. Logan. Without Louise's knowledge, Mrs. Logan notified the bank that her account would absorb the charge. Also on the same day, Louise and Judson moved back into the Logan home. Louise claimed throughout the community and to Mrs. Logan's friends that Arthur Logan experienced several violent outbursts and that one day the friends would read it in the newspaper of a terrible tragedy. Louise's plan, already in motion, included permanently ridding her of Mr. Arthur Logan. Louise went to the institute where Mrs. Logan committed her husband on March 19th and Louise convinced Arthur Logan to accompany her to her probation officer on the pretext that Mrs. Logan had been seriously injured in an automobile accident. With Arthur Logan in tow, Louise posed as Mrs. Logan's foster sister, and because of the statements she made at the time to her probation officer, the state of California permanently committed Arthur Logan to a psychiatric ward of the county hospital, and later to the Patton State Hospital. Subsequently, Arthur Logan languished in the Patton State Hospital and eventually died on September 6, 1944. Louise gave instructions to the staff at Patton that if Arthur died, donate his body to science. Louise exhibited difficulty in concealing Mrs. Logan's whereabouts. Ever creative, cunning, and diabolical, Louise responded to these queries by stating that when Arthur Logan got violent with his wife, he disfigured her drastically. After Mr. Logan's commitment, Mrs. Logan sought to improve her appearance and engaged a highly regarded plastic surgeon to reconstruct her looks. The story seemed plausible for only a little while because Louise stated that Mrs. Logan traveled to Santa Monica, California, Oregon, and as far as east as New York. Louise also proclaimed that she and Judson would be purchasing the Logan household because Mrs. Logan no longer desired the personality in the home and had told her to do what she wanted with it, that Mrs. Logan did not want her car, and Mrs. Logan would never return to California. From May 31st, Louise and Judson resided in the former Logan residence and took it upon herself to alter some of Mrs. Logan's clothing to fit her, open the mail, and answer letters as Mrs. Logan. Once Louise learned that Arthur Logan died in September, she forged a letter in Mrs. Logan's signature and sent an application for death benefits in the amount of $1,425 to the Patton Hospital to capitalize on Arthur's death. Additionally, as a condition of her parole she received in 1939, Mrs. Logan took the responsibility of writing monthly reports on Louise's progress. Mysteriously, Louise started writing the reports in June of 1944 and continued until December of that year. Once the parole officer examined the reports more closely, this became Louise's undoing. 
On December 20, 1944, Los Angeles police detained Louise Pete Judson for the forged parole reports, then held her in connection with the disappearance of Mrs. Logan. Shortly after her arrest, while searching for Mrs. Logan on the Logan property, between the big, solid gate between the garage and the corner of the house intended to block the view of that area, the police located a shallow grave near the backyard. Police Captain Thad Brown announced that the body of a woman, believed to be Margaret Logan, was found buried in a backyard at Pacific Palisades at nearby Santa Monica. A later autopsy revealed that a bullet had entered the back of the neck and struck the fourth cervical vertebra, narrowly missing the spinal cord, and had passed out of the body below the left jaw. Death was caused by two depressed fractures of the skull. Police took Lee Borden Judson, Louise's husband, into custody as a material witness. Police even suspected that Louise may have had something to do with the death of Emily Latham, her first parole officer, who died in an alleged heart attack shortly after sponsoring Louise. Louise proclaimed loudly that she had nothing to do with Mrs. Logan's death. She only buried the body. Held without bail, Louise and Judson steadfastly denied murdering Mrs. Logan. As they sat waiting their fate, Captain Brown stated that Louise would also be investigated for the death of Mrs. Jessie Mercy. Mr. Ray Summers filed a complaint against Louise outlining her culpability in the death of Marcy a few months before. Sommer stated that Marcy had dropped from sight, later injured her hip in an accident, and subsequently died. Mrs. Marcy lived in a small apartment of the house Louise ran for a short time as a boarding house for soldiers and sailors of the West Coast. Sommers also declared that he found Mrs. Marcy's house in wild disorder and saw spots on the floor that may have been bloodstains. Some days later, the coroner of Los Angeles County confirmed that Mrs. Marcy died as a result of natural causes. With the death of Mrs. Marcy determined natural, the police concentrated further on the death of Mrs. Logan. Once the police examined the Logan residence for any evidence implicating Louise and Judson, they discovered a bullet that they believed was the last one to have killed Margaret Logan. The bullet, found in one of the inner walls of the house, came from a 32 caliber weapon found in the home. The exact location of the round found in the living room was 38 inches from the floor, just over the Davenport. District Attorney Fred Hauser, present at the scene with the police, theorized that if a woman had been shot when she was sitting on the Davenport, the bullet could have passed through her mouth, gone through the back of her neck, and buried itself in the wall at just the right height, where today's slug was discovered. An autopsy performed on Mrs. Logan stated that she died from a blow to the head with a bullet wound as a contributory factor. The bullet had gone through her mouth and out her neck, one of the coroner stated with certainty. It appeared that someone plastered over the hole in a slipshod way to conceal it. Incidentally, the weapon found at the Logan residence was the same weapon registered to Emily Latham, the deceased parole officer first assigned to Louise Pete Judson. With the evidence mounting against Louise Pete, the final coroner's inquest, held on January 3, 1945, recommended that the Los Angeles District Attorney hold Louise Pete Judson and Lee Judson for the murder of Margaret Logan. When told the coroner's inquest determined his culpability in the death of Mrs. Logan, Judson stated that he helped Louise withdraw $900 to $1,000 from an account in Logan's name, but unwaveringly denied that he helped his wife murder the 60-year-old real estate agent. Judson exclaimed that Louise contacted him in a panic and pleaded with him to come to the Logan residence. Something terrible has happened. Judson drove to the Logan residence and met Louise in the driveway, and she appeared disheveled. Louise related to Judson that Arthur Logan attacked Margaret Logan and chewed off her nose and bitten at her throat. In a move citizens questioned at the time, after a preliminary hearing to determine whether Pete and Judson could be tried for the murder of Mrs. Logan, along with the other confidence tricks, authorities released Lee and Judson due to a lack of evidence. However, Louise Pete Reed would stand trial for the murder of Mrs. Logan. Louise maintained that Mrs. Logan suffered her death at the hands of her deceased husband and she had nothing to do with Mrs. Logan's demise. Sadly, on January 12, 1945, true to the Louise curse, Lee Borden Judson jumped to his death from the 13th floor of a financial building in the heart of Los Angeles after being cleared by the district attorney for any culpability in Mrs. Logan's death. I knew it would happen, Louise stated. I had a premonition. He just couldn't face dishonor and disgrace. As long as I was with him, he was a marked man. Louise's reaction in the prison matron's office, where the guards brought her to receive the news, turned melancholy and wept hysterically. 
Earlier husbands who met the same fate at Jetson drew little if no remorse or grief from the convicted murderess. Perhaps she finally reached a level of human emotion. Louise refused to attend her deceased husband's services, stating, I don't want to humiliate his family further. They are good people. The timing of her remorse proved tardy. While Louise allegedly mourned her deceased husband, her attorneys, public defenders William B. Neely and Ellery Cuff, seriously considered entering a plea of insanity on behalf of their client. Furthermore, Superior Judge William McKay ordered that Mrs. Logan's body be exhumed and re-examined by the county coroner, Dr. Jesse Carr. Dr. Carr determined that a round from a firearm fired from behind Mrs. Logan entered the back of her neck and exited through her left cheek. The coroner also determined that Mrs. Logan died primarily from a skull fracture. These conclusions called into doubt Louise's version of the events. Even though the evidence undoubtedly proved her to be the killer, Louise pled not guilty on February 9, 1945, with trial set for April 23, 1945. The trial began on the appointed date and a jury of 11 women and one man passed voir dire to sit for the Louise trial. Unlike her earlier tribulations, Louise decided she had nothing to lose and began to make a mockery of her proceedings. On May 1, 1945, Louise waited until District Attorney John Barnes explained his theory of the case before the defendant screamed out, That's a lie! Under direct examination from her attorney, William Neely, the attorney asked his client the question, Did you kill Mr. Denton? The defendant responded, I did not know whether he's alive or dead. Louise stated, even though she served 18 years for her crime, that her husband and her attorney at the time convinced her not to testify on her own behalf. She would not make that mistake this time. Or would she? Louise testified further that she heard several shots, which contradicted the official coroner's report as only one bullet was discovered, and Arthur Logan fired the weapon at his wife from a standing position, again, contradicting the official coroner's report and a ballistics expert called to testify later. Louise also averred that Arthur Logan struck his wife several times with a steak pounder, obviously a meat tenderizer of sorts, but the coroner's examination, both examinations, failed to reveal any marks that matched the utensil. A later report stated that blood and hair were found on the revolver and butt of the weapon which contained a defect fitted perfectly into the two depressed fractures of the skull that were the cause of death. Louise's protestations most certainly felt upon deaf ears and her testimony served more to convict than acquit her. It appeared that Mr. Logan may have been the only witness to corroborate her rendition of what happened to Mrs. Logan. He too died before bringing the story to light. Or, Louise lied the whole time, murdered Mrs. Logan, assumed her money, and carried on the charade to conceal that she murdered once more. The trial continued unabated for the next 28 days until May 28, 1945, when Superior Court Judge Harold B. Landreth charged the jury with the duties as it pertained to the people of California versus Louise Pete. Judge Landreth presented the jury with charges that would almost assuredly produce a conviction, Judge Landreth imposed on the jury that they must consider one of five verdicts guilty of first-degree murder with penalty of death in the shootings and bludgeonings of her benefactress, Mrs. Margaret Logan, guilty of first-degree murder with life imprisonment recommended, guilty of second-degree murder, guilty of manslaughter, or innocent. On May 28, 1945, a long and nefarious career finally came to an end. A jury of 11 women and one man found Louise Pete Judson guilty of murder in the first degree and recommended the death penalty. None of the jurors entertained the thought of mercy for Louise. As the twice convicted murderer left the courtroom after the reading of the verdict, a reporter asked her if she had anything to say and Louise responded, not a thing. On June 1st, Judge Landreth sentenced Louise to death in the gas chamber of California State Penitentiary at California Institute of Women at Tehachapi. Louise's battle for a new trial continued for the next year. After the appeals appeared exhausted, in October of 1946, the governor of California, Earl Warren, set the date for Louise's execution for November 1st, 1946. In his decision to refuse clemency, 
Governor Warren stated that he reviewed the court testimony and all the other evidence. He decided that there is no extenuating circumstance that would cause me to stop the execution. Luis maintained her innocence and continued to appeal as long as courts would hear her pleas. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Department delivered Luis to the California Institution for Women at Tehachapi, California. Later, on December 9, 1946, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to review the legality of her conviction. After this refusal, Governor Warren reset Luis's execution for April 11, 1947. During the four days prior to the scheduled execution, newspapers made repeated requests to be present for the execution. Ms. Alma Holtzsche, superintendent for the California Institute of Women at Tehachapi, California, hurriedly prepared Luis for her impending execution. Superintendent Holtzsche requested that doctors be in attendance with any type of sedatives needed to ensure that Luis would remain calm before the execution. After Lafayette Luis Presler Pete Judson breathed her last at approximately 12.15 p.m., the morbidity surrounding the death of a convicted killer took hold. Newspapers immediately began guessing where the body would be brought and who would attend any services, if any. After prison officials removed her body from the gas chamber and placed it upon a gurney, a hearse from Los Angeles then arrived and whisked the body away from prying journalists. In her very last interview, Louise stated that, I should not have been held for anything except the mistake of not reporting Mrs. Logan's death. It appeared that even facing death for her crimes, Louise never admitted her culpability in the death and destruction she caused. The Bitch of Bienville, also known as the Belle of Bienville, demonstrated nothing but disdain for those who showed any affection toward her whatsoever. Considered charming, attractive, and intelligent even into her older years, Lofia Louise Preslauer used her feminine wiles throughout her criminal career and desperately hoped that her erotic ruses brought the wealth she so desired. Her upbringing obviously did not take hold. Granted, being born in the South does not necessarily bestow upon someone, especially a female, the ability to live a life free from temptation. But with the privilege Louise enjoyed growing up in Louisiana, one would think that her moral compass may have been better calibrated than most. However, this is not to say that Louisianans are more pious than the rest of the country. It can just be said that Lofia Louise Preslauer Pete Judson believed that her desires and wants outweighed those of the people she swindled, cajoled, and eventually murdered. Louise learned that crime does not pay, no matter how charming, manipulative, and attractive a person may be. Now don't forget, if you want to contribute, we're over on Rumble.com, we're over on PayPal, and we're over on GoFundMe. I'll leave the links below. Until next time.